about when that kind of glory came in, it says that his train filled the temple. And if you know anything about the train that represents on, on a king, the longer the trail, the, the longer the train on that, on his like his uh his cloak basically, the longer that is, the more battles he's had. And the little notches and everything down that train was all the things he took back from the enemy. So we have to realize we are the temple of God, right? So when that Shekinah glory comes into us and that trail and that train fills us, all the battles, everything that we face on a daily basis, he's already took all that stuff back. He's already took all that stuff back from the enemy. And so when I hear that song, I think about, Lord, just press and get all the people out of the sanctuary, out of the flesh. Let's get into the Spirit of God because that's where our victories are at, right? That's where our empowerment's at is walking in the Spirit of God. In Romans, it talks about that there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that walk not according to the flesh but walk in the Spirit. So if we're walking in our flesh, guess what we have? We have condemnation, right? Which is judgment. So we got to be able to, to step outside of our flesh, our flesh and serve God in a manner that is acceptable to Him, amen? According to His standards and His statutes. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Everybody there? We'll start at 1. Alright, let's go. So, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of your vocation wherewith ye are called. Well, Paul is telling us, listen, when it says walk, you have, there's an effort there. It don't say to sit. Don't sit in your vocation. Don't sit in what God's called you to do. It says to walk. That means we have to be in motion in order to properly serve God the way that he wants and the things that he's given us, right? So Paul's telling us, look, walk worthy of that. You know, we've been called to be holy. The Bible says, be ye holy for I am holy, right? So that's what we've been called to be is, is to walk in that holiness, to walk in that righteousness, and walk in that fulfillment. Wherewith we are called. We, we have been called, right? So he called us out of that darkness into his marvelous life. And what's good about the way God is and the way that Holy Spirit works is he don't call the qualified people. He qualifies the called people. Because let me tell you, when we've been called from that dark from that darkness into his marvelous light, you don't know anything. So of course you're going to have to qualify us, right? And what's great about that is that he gives us everything that we need. If we sit down and, and take the time, he gives us everything we need to what? To become qualified in the things that he's called us to do. Because why? Because we're going to be led by him. We're going to be, his word is a lamp to our, pe our feet and a light into our path. So we have everything that we need that we can walk worthy of the calling in our lives of what we have, right? And I forget exactly where it's at, but it talks about the whole duty of man is to listen to the whole consolation and to be obedient to God. That's it. It's pretty simple. Paul said, I've received the grace of God to be obedient to the gospel. It's pretty simple in the things that we need to do, but so many people want to make it complicated. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. That long-suffering, that's being patient for long periods of time. You know, and God has been patient with us. Now listen, if we're not walking on water, he's still waiting on us to do it. Amen? Because what he asks us to do, he asks us, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so what he wants us to do, he wants, to re he wants us to reach that level of maturity that we are fully dependent on him, that we're walking in the ways that he's called us to walk. So he wants us to reach our potential. And let me tell you something, when the Holy Spirit is working in your life, we're not walking in our flesh, and we're serving God, and we're studying his word and everything, our potential is greater than we could ever imagine. Because if you think about it, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the, from the grave, we have that same spirit that dwells in us. When Peter took, took the crippled man and said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, and he let him go, we have the same spirit that dwells in us. We yeah. have the same ability in that. And imagine how much faith it took for Peter when he said, rise up and walk, and he let him go. That takes a lot of faith. A lot of people say, rise up and walk, and like, let, you just let go a little bit to see if he's going to walk. Peter says he let him go. That takes a lot of faith. That's what we got to be able to, to realize in our minds that we have the same capability as all the disciples did and all the things that you said. When Moses split the Red Sea, we have the capability. We just have to realize we got to be able to tap into that. And how do we tap into that? We get out of our flesh and get into the Spirit of God and we study His Word. That's how we're able to do that. Amen? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, in the hope of your calling. Listen, that, that calling that we have is to serve God. Just show up and let God be God. That's what we've been called to do is just to trust Him, to follow Him, to let, 
to let him be our example as we walk. And that hope, like I said, that's not a dead hope. That's an assured expectancy. The hope that we have in Christ Jesus, it's alive. It's not like, well, I hope something's going to come to pass. No, the hope that we have is an assured expectancy. We're going to expect that if we don't serve God in a way where we anticipate Him to show up in our situations and our struggles, then what are we doing? Where's our anticipation at? Where's our hope at? If we're not anticipating the Holy Spirit and God to move in our behalf, where are we putting our hope at? In this words that leave our lips. we got to believe the words that are coming out of our mouth in our heart first, right? And when we have those things in our heart, when it leaves our lips, it's leaving in faith. Nothing doubting, nothing wavering. And when it leaves our lips, we should know that, hey, I'm anticipating a return. Whether it's the answer I want or the answer I don't want, I know regardless God's word is not going to come back void. And if I, the things that I speak, if I believe them in my heart, let them leave with faith from my lips, no matter what, God's in control. One God, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm so grateful for that. So a lot of people put, you know, when I first got straightened up, I used to go to NA meetings, and you couldn't talk about Jesus. There was a higher power and this and that. I'm grateful that I got one God I got to serve. I don't have to go to this one and go to that one. I got one God. I can go into that Holy of Holies now that when Jesus died on the cross and ripped the veil, now I can personally go into the Holy of Holies. I don't need a priest. I don't need a pastor. I don't need I don't need anybody. I mean myself. I can go into the Holy of Holies in my deepest, darkest spot when I'm, when I'm everything good. I have that ability now. We all have that ability to enter into the Holy of Holies. We don't have to tie a rope and bells and slip the the throat of the lamb and, and try to get in there and see if we're good, right? Because that's what they used to do with the priest. They'd tie bells and rope on it. The bell stopped ringing up. Oh, he wasn't ready. Drag him out. He's dead when they'd go into the presence of God. But listen, all of our sin, all of our ugliness, all the things that we have, we can take right to the throne and lay it at his feet. Guess what he gives us in return? Grace and peace. We can go in there with anxiety and depression and aggravation and, and disease and sickness and lay it at his feet. Guess what we come back with? Healing to sound mind, sobriety, a restored body. Those are the things that he wants to train for us. But when we leave them there, we got to know that the words that we leave them there with are with faith when they leave our mouth. Amen. Amen. See, you're supposed to go here with my name where I look scripture. You're number six. Number six. One God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One God. And you know, when it talks about Almighty God, that Almighty means there's no contenders. There's nothing that can contend, contend with Him. Your doubt, your faith, your unbelief, you know, the devil in hell can't contend with God because of, just because I, I don't believe, you think that's going to hinder God from moving? It'll hinder Him moving in my life, but not in nobody else's life. Listen, we got to get on that movement that... God's going to do His plan, and it's going to come to pass, and you can either be a part of it or not. You either in or you're not, right? And so, just for us to think about that, He's allowed us to enter in into this to this family as we've been adopted into this family. We are the spiritual Israel, so we have been adopted into this family. And so, you think about you think about all the things you've ever done in your life, and yet He says, "I want you to be part of my kingdom. I want you to be part. Of, I want you to be royalty." I want you to know that you're a chosen generation. I want you to know that you are a saint, that you're a child of the Most High God. I want you to know that you are more than an overcomer. I want you to know all these positive things about you. I want you not only to know them, I want you to walk in them. I want you to understand that when you walk in this anointing that God has given us, there's victory in that. Yes. And when we walk, the Bible says where the Spirit of God is, there's liberty to walk as we're able to walk. Right? Right. Eight. Seven. Seven. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of God. That grace that he has given us, the Bible says we're able to grow from grace to grace to grace, right? So we're, that grace that we have allows us to sit down with God, read his word, and be able to grow in that grace, right? We're able to become strong. We're able to become more clear-minded. We're able to become more rooted in the grace of God that God has given us because there's freedom in that to do what we need to do in the spirit of God. So we're able to grow in that grace, which is great because he wants us to always get to the next level. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up... Yep. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Listen, I'm going to read the next one. 
Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? A lot of people twist that scripture when it says that he took captivity captive, and they, they think he went into hell and preached a message and pulled people out of hell. That's not what that's saying. What's the only thing kept Jesus captive? Think about it. what's the only thing kept him captive? Death in the grave. That's it. And that's when he says he took captivity captive. He took that death in the grave, and now he took that captive. He didn't go into hell like a, a lot of Catholics will preach that. No, he went into hell and he preached the message and, and delivered all these people out of hell. No, he didn't. The only thing that could keep Jesus captive was death in the grave and he overcame it. So that captivity that had us all captive, he overcame that. And he took that captivity captive. Right? And so we have to think about that. That's the only two things that could hold him captive. And he took him back. He said, no, I'm going to hold this captive. No longer is death going to have the power and, and uh, the grave going to have, or death going to have the sting and the death going to have the power. No more. Right? And so, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. He wants to fulfill all things, right? When it talks about also, you know, you think about the Ten Commandments and he said all those, that's a perpetual covenant. That means that is an ongoing covenant. It's going to last forever. And we're part of that. And he, he said that, that not a spot, not a tittle, nothing will be taken away from that until all has been fulfilled, right? But not, he wants to fill every aspect of our life. He, not, he wants to fill your heart. He wants to fill, you know, your mind. He wants to fill everything about you. He wants him to be number one. He wants to be number one in your life above everything else. And listen. You know, he wants, he wants your relationship with him to be above your wife, above your dad, above your, your, wife, your husband, above all these different things. He wants to be number one. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? So when we seek him first, everything else is going to be added. All the things that we need are going to be added. And we share it before that. The word of God and the church is not a handout. It's a hand up. If we, you can hand stuff out, but if... Like, when we go do the homeless, if we're just handing food out, we're not ministering to nobody, it's not doing them no good. Physically it is, but mentally if we're not sharing with people and we're not talking to people, and us as believers, if we're not sharing our faith and the things that we have with unbelievers out there, what are we doing? Right? That's not what he's called us to do. In the Great Commission, he says, go out on the highways and the byways and and make disciples and, and, and make, you know, believers. That's what he's called us to do. And we all have that ability. Every day when you get out of bed and you leave your house, guess what you become? You become that ambassador. You become a, a minister of reconciliation. That, that ministry that we have is to reconcile people back to God. What are we doing with it? Right? And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers... We were talking about this back there. There comes a point in time in your walk, you're going to have to put down the commentaries, you're going to have to quit looking on the internet, and you're going to have to just sit down with God, His Holy Spirit, and nothing but His Word, and let Him teach you. Because what happens is there's so much information out there, whether it be commentaries or stuff off the internet, all you're doing is sitting down studying another man's idea. Yeah. Right? And it comes to a point where the Bible says, let no man teach you but the Holy Spirit, right? So there comes a time, a point in time, that we have to set that stuff down. I'm not saying set it down permanently, but there has to take a time where we set that down and we sit down on God's Word. So if we have to believe that God is able, through His Holy Spirit, to teach us the deep things of God. Right? And the deep things of God are in His Word, not in commentary, not in another man's belief, not on different things that we look on the Internet. There's good information out there, but in order to reach the fullness that God wants us to do, we got to be studying this book. There's some good commentaries out there, and there's some that are way out left field. So if we're rooted and we're studying this, we will we'll recognize that. We'll see that like, hey, that's not what God's Word says, right? That's not the way that I understand God's Word to be. So we need to get to a point where we just sit down with God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, and just sit down and study His Word. Amen? Because it talks about that God's children were perished because of what? A lack of understanding, right? And, you know, there's sometimes we're ignorant of things, right? We don't understand God's Word or we haven't read it. But the Bible says in Acts that God will wink at our ignorance. But He's only going to do that for a moment. Once you've read something and God's revealed something to you, now you're accountable to that. What are you going to do with it? Right? For the perfecting of the who? Perfecting of the who? The saints. That's us. You're not a sinner, simple sinner saved by grace. You're a saint. Right? 
So it's for, for what? What's it saying? It says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for edifying of the body of Christ. It's for perfecting of the saints, for the work and the ministry. He wants us to do what? He wants us to be edified, right? And he, he wants us to be perfected. We are saints. And you know, pe- people, people, some people think like, oh, we shouldn't say that. We're, we're just simple sinners saved by grace. That's the worst mentality to have. You're claiming to be a dead man walking. That's the worst mentality to have. God don't call us that, right? Either we're a new creation or we're not. Either we're a new creation, created in the image of God, or you're not. You can't be both. I choose to cling to the positive things that God tells me what I am in the Bible. Amen? Are we at 13? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measures of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every kind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Listen, we can't be tossed to and fro. What keeps us from being tossed to and fro is being anchored. I've shared this before about being anchored in Christ Jesus. And I shared about, you know, it's not the anchor that is the most important part of that whole system. From the ship to the chain to the anchor, we always think that anchor is the most important part. It's not. I did that study and I looked at it. The most important part is the chain between the vessel and the anchor. The anchor is already the greatest thing that you can connect yourself to. But listen, you're that vessel. You're that boat. If you're not connected solidly to that anchor, that anchor does no good for you in your life. It does no good. And so what it talks about is when they drop anchor and they raise their sail, it's to turn them straight into the storm. Right? So they don't get capsized. They don't become a shipwreck. So you've got to ask yourself, how, what kind of chain do I have between me and my anchor? Do I read once in a while? Do I study once in a while? Do I go to church once in a while? Do I pray once in a while? Then that weight of that chain that you have is probably not that good, and you're going to be tossed to and fro. You're going to be tossed all over the place because I've shared it a million times. Well, maybe not a million, but a lot. I've shared it a bunch of times. Like, listen, you can't serve God in your emotions and your feelings. You're going to be shipwrecked. You're going to be tossed to and fro all the time. We cannot serve God in our feelings. We can't serve God in our emotions. We have to serve Him in the fullness of what His Word says, right? And His Word says that we're more than overcomers, right? We're more than just victorious. We're more than just these, these blind sheep just, just walking to this voice. We are children created in the image of God. That's what we have to realize. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body fit jointly together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body into the edifying of itself in love. Listen, we all serve a purpose in the, in the household of God, right? We're not all ministers. We're not all evangelists. We're not all greeters or helpers. But, but what we are all as one body is we are all servants of God, right? We are all a servant. Listen, it doesn't matter if, if you're a supervisor, if you're a worker, if you're a business owner. You're a servant to something, right? I would rather be a servant to God than let all that other stuff be what it is. It is what it is. I know if I serve God, I'm going to be good no matter what. You know? And so we have to realize, too, that, you know, we have all have a purpose in the church. You know, there might be a day God said, Billy, you're done. Sit down. Just just, just sit down. Okay, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll go be a greeter. I'll go be a deacon. Whatever it is, I don't care. My goal was never to be a pastor anyway. That was never, never even crossed my mind about being a pastor. And I've shared this before, too. We were at Barrel of Hope Church. And the lady from Kenya was giving some word, and she was prophesying over people, right? And so I was like, I was already kind of leery that you listen. You got to be careful if you let people prophesy over your life, because if you're not careful, you're going to manipulate your own life to do exactly what they told you was going to happen. And so my friend Kevin, he went up. He's from Buck Little. Kevin, some, I can't remember his name now. Freeman, uh, Freeman. Kevin Freeman. He was in the men's home with me. And uh, he wanted to go to work. And so he went up there, and that lady, lady told him, hey, when you go to work, you work hard. And that's what he was praying about. It kind of blew him away, right? And so I go up there, and she goes, you know, you're going to do great things in the church. And I came back and told him, yeah, she's full of crap. <laughs> right? Because that was not my focus. My focus was not to be a pastor. And, and, you know, when you just sit down and you just do what God calls you to do, you'll be amazed where he places you. 
right? We all have a unique personality. We all have a unique purpose, and he wants to qualify us to do what he's called us to do. Amen? Are we at 17? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that he henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles, walk in the vanity of their mind. Listen, we're not all that in the bag of chips. Right? We all have flaws. We all have things we have to work on. But we can't walk in that vanity, right? Listen, we're all just servants. Jesus, he said, I didn't come here to serve, to be served. I came here to serve, right? And, you know, when you read the King James, it talks about, I didn't come here to be ministered to. Be minister to. I came to minister, right? And that's what he's called when he sat down and washed the disciples' feet. And you think about when he washed the disciples' feet, Peter said, oh, no, no, Lord, not my feet. And, and the Lord told him, listen, if I can't wash your feet, you can't have no part of me. And here comes Peter. Wash my feet and my head, Lord. Wash my feet and my head. Because he wanted to be a part of that. Right? So we came to be what? To just be servants. To serve one another. To serve an unloving world that we're not going to probably receive nothing back from the world. Our riches and our treasures come from heaven. It's stored right. up in heaven for us. Where moth can't tear it up. Nothing will, will tear it up. And he says he's going to bring his reward with him. Lord, bring mine. I just want to be ready. I just want to show up and let God be God in my life. And it's just amazing what he does. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Listen, most people miss, miss you know, that, that eternal glory by this far. 18 inches. Their head's in it, but their heart's not in it. And, you know, people say, you know, people, you can see the fruit in people's lives, Right? And you can tell if their heart's in it or not because it produces the fruit that they have. And people say, oh, that guy's just riding the fence. Let me tell you something. That fence belongs to the dead. 100%. You're either in or you're out. That's, it's just super simple. Who being past feeling have given themselves over into the lavishness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But as ye have not so learned Christ, if so... Be that ye have learned him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That ye put off all concerning the former conversations, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful love. It says, put off the old man. So if 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that you're a new creation, are you the old man still in that new creation or are you an absolute new creation? You might dress the same and you might talk the same and you look the same, but there has to be a change in you. It doesn't mean that you're not going to make mistakes, but there has to be a newness, a new mindset, a new way to think and approach things in your life. Or maybe you're not really a new creation. You took this fictitious name and says, hi, I'm a Christian, but there hasn't been no life change. There has to be a change in your life if you're a new creation. And you should be able to look in the mirror and look at your life in the last however long you've been served. Lord, there has to be a change in, the, in your mentality, in the way that you talk, in the way that you address things, right? There has to be that change in your life. 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And that you put on the new man, you have to put him on. Here's the grace. Here's the ability. People say, well, you didn't do nothing to receive grace. Yeah, you absolutely did. You have to accept it. You know, that grace of God is a, it's a gift from God, but you still have to accept that grace, right? You have to choose to put that on. You have to choose to do what God has called you to do in that grace, you know? And we walk, we are saved by grace, by faith, not of works, at least any man should boast. But we have to make the choice, I'm going to accept this gift. I'm not going to squander this gift. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, cast this gift under my feet, what I'm going to do is cherish this gift that God has given me that allows me to be a new creation. I was a bad drug addict for a long time, and God gave me this grace. Here you go. It's up to you. Do you want to change your life? Do you want to be something better? Do you want to be sober? Do you want to restore your family? Do you, do you, do you want me? Here, it's up to you. I'm not going to force this on you, but here, I'm going to lay this grace at your feet, and you do with what you want, right? And so for me, what I've shared before is that that scripture said, go and sin no more and leave something worse come upon you. And I thought, oh my God, I was horrible. Bad drug addict, I had a bad attitude. I was just nothing nice to be around. And I thought, man, worse than that? What's worse than that? And so that scripture always brought a little bit of fear in me because I'm not putting this down. I'm not walking away from this. And sometimes... Whatever scripture in your life that God has given you, you have to cling to that. Everybody has like what they say, a life scripture. 
right? As when you get saved or you're going through things. But listen, that scripture might change throughout your walk. Because God's word is alive, it's powerful. And there's, let me tell you, for every question that you have, the answer's in here if you look hard enough, right? For every, every emotion that you go through, every struggle that you go through, every victory you go through, it's in here. But nobody wants to dig and study and look for it. Right? If you have if you struggle with, with depression or fear, look up the word fear and start reading every scripture that in the in the Bible that talks about fear. Right? But we don't do that. We have so much ability and we have so much technology that we can, right? Which after God. And that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let the let sin not. Not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Listen, you can't walk hand in hand with the Lord and make eyes at the world. You can't do that. That you become a double-minded man, unstable in all your ways. And the Bible says when you grab a hold of that plow which represents Jesus Christ and you look back at the things of the world, you are unfit for the kingdom. Right? So we either have to grab that plow and say, listen, I'm not going to be a lot's wife. What I'm going to be is I'm going to grab a hold of that plow of Jesus Christ and those things that are behind me are behind me. Who cares? We can't change it. Right? You're not going to change it. Don't, those sins are well in it. Right? We have, to, we have to try to press forward. Right? And when we do that, most of the time when people look back, it's on the prior mistakes that they make. Right? We're not bound by that. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Let, let him that stole still no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, and the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Listen, I've shared it before, church is not a hand out, it's a hand up. If we you know, you see a lot of people they just hand and hand stuff out, which is a good thing, but if we're not discipling people, when we give out God's word and you share God's word with other people in your life, if we're not teaching them how to apply that word, it's not going to do them no good. Right? And that, like I shared before, my, 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 my prayer has always been, Lord, give me a message for where I'm at that I can share with where everybody's at. Not that I'm higher or lower. We're just, and, and you know, I hate that when people say, oh, they're on a different level. Now we're on the same level. We just have different understandings at different times, right? And not everybody's going to have a deep understanding this and a deep understanding that. But we're all on an equal playing field. Why? Because God said he's not a respecter of person. So it's not like you've been exalted to this new level or, or pushed down to this level. What we have is the ability to serve God on an equal, play, on, on a, on a equal playing field. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use of the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. And grieve not the, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. People take that scripture and think, oh, once saved, always saved. What's that say? It says saved unto, not until. That's two different things. We have been sanctified and set apart unto God, right? We have been sanctified, and that scripture says that we have been sealed unto that day, not until that day. That's a whole different That's a whole different thing. That we have been set aside for that day of redemption. We have been set aside for that. And don't say until. That's why the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling, right? That we have to we have to work this thing out. Not I don't believe you lose your salvation. I believe you walk away from it. Right? When you read about when it talks about that nothing can snatch us from the hand of God, there's you know, there's, there's mountains and valleys and pestilence and all these different things. The only thing not labeled in that whole scripture is us. That's the only thing that's not listed in there is us. Because we don't lose it. We just walk away from it. Because if, we, if you're once saved and you're always saved, then there's no free will in that. Right? He wants us to serve him because we love him. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and glamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He didn't forgive him for his sake. He forgave him for Christ. Jesus went to the cross. Listen, you know there's no power when Jesus died on that cross. There's no power in that. There's no power in that. 
The power comes from the resurrection from the grave. There's been many prophets, many so-called gods die. There's no power in that. The power is him coming out of the grave. That's where the power's at. We are the only religion that is different where our Savior has been resurrected, right? Amen. So there's no power in him dying on that cross. If he would have died on that cross and never rose from the grave, guess what? We'd still be like we are. But he took that captivity captive. He took death in the grave captive and says, no longer will you have dominion over my people. Right? And so now, we, it's, a, it's a point in all men die, but then we get to live forever. Right? If, he, if we walk as we are to walk and we do the things that we got, we're going to be, he's going to allow us to take off that corruption, put on any corruption. He's going to allow us to take off this mortality that we have and put on immortality. Never once in the scriptures do you read where he is an unbeliever mortality. Right? He, that's a gift for us. As we walk, he said, to those that overcome, I'll grant to them to be a pillar in my Father's house. How many people want to be a pillar? I want to be a pillar in my Father's house, right? If right. you think about a pillar, that's a, that is a very structural thing that upholds the whole thing. I want to be a pillar. I want to be a pillar in my Father's house. The only way that I can do that, according to Scripture, is for me to endure and overcome. And how do I overcome? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Good word, Billy. Actually, I'm just going to share with you Psalms 23. Everybody should know it, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. So if the Lord is your shepherd, guess what? We're not going to have to walk for anything. Amen? What's number two say? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Not somebody else. Not your wife. Not your husband. Not your fellow brother. But him himself makes us lay down in green pasture. He leadeth me by the still water. He restored my soul. Him alone is going to restore our soul. Amen? Here's the best part. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. It's not for our name's sake. It's not for your name's sake. It's not for the church of God's name's sake. It's not for the assembly of God's name. It's for his name's sake that he puts us in the path of righteousness. Amen? Yet, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, here it is, I will fear no evil. There's that word fear. Even though you walk through the shadow of the valley of death, as long as your shepherd is Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Here, what does he do when you make him your shepherd? Thou perish the table. Before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. He's going to set you before your enemies. And you're going to be alright. Because he's your shepherd. The last one. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why is uh, goodness and mercy going to follow? And we're all going to dwell in the house of the Lord. Forever. But to dwell in his house, that shepherd has to be Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. That was just a little bit that he 